Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Midday Live on TV3 with me, Martin Isidu Dati, coming up this afternoon. Today marks seven years since President John Evans at Mills passed on, but his resting place at Sundre Park still in a sorry state. Civil and local government staff association of Ghana Clocksack protest the politicization of the civil service. We will also tell you how Asin Kushia, a community in the central region, has existed over the years without filth. And on the foreign front, Boris Johnson heads to Downing Street later today after he takes over from Theresa May as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Thank you very much for staying with us. My name is Martin Acedo Dati. Details of our stories now. It's been seven years since President John Evans at Mills passed on. Earlier, some members of the NDC and other individuals laid wreath at the Asumjie Park here in Accra, where he was laid to rest. We'll have details of that story shortly for you, but you'd also, we'll be glad to hear from you as well. Let us know how you will remember the former president, John Evans at Mills, who passed away seven years exactly today and uh, he is the first president to have passed away in office to let us know how you remember him how you marked the day and where you were when that news broke of his passage we'll be happy to hear from you in other news it is supposed to be a resting place for president of the republic who passed on but the least said about it in its current state as a presidential burial ground the better. Evelyn Tingma reports the Asumjue Park in Accra, where the late President John Evans at Mills was buried, needs a serious facelift as original plans of the place still hang. The death of President John Evans at Mills in 2012 came as a shock to the whole Ghana and even beyond. A state decision was taken to use portions of the Geese Park close to the Osu Castle as a burial ground for sitting and former presidents who may pass on. It was named Asumje Park. A library, a mausoleum, a fish pond and a mini zoo were to be put up. Information gathered by TV3 indicates one Don Arthur was awarded the contract to design and build the Asumje Park but we were unable to reach him. Construction of the library and mausoleum, which began at the time, have remained uncompleted till now. Portions of the place is also yet to be walled. Meanwhile, the fish pond and the mini zoo are functioning. A few weeks ago, when TV3 first visited the park, the miniature graves were not in good shape. Portions of the park were also weedy. Benches there broken and picture billboards collapsed. This is the tomb where our former president, John Evans Atamels, was laid to rest some years ago. And indeed, this is where he is resting. Now, one would have expected that the tomb in which he lays would have been kept very neat. But as we speak, we have certain cracks on the tomb. And of course, the cloth that has been used to decorate this particular place is also torn apart and this obviously is not good enough for the person that he was here on earth but two weeks after our first visit things had changed now you can say the tomb has been changed sort of because previously uh, if you looked closely it was cracked certain portions were cracked but as we speak this is uh, quite new and this is just few days to the seventh anniversary of the late president. The miniature graves had also been changed, the wooden picture board removed, and flowers planted. The national security is currently manning the place. Earlier, 
There were reports of miscreants, including alleged wee smokers, invading the park at night, which the national security has denied. Tourists and other people, we were told, visit the park at no fee. Former Deputy General Secretary of the NDC, Koku Anyidoho, is worried the current state of the Asumje Park is not a fair reflection of the man who served his nation well. We at the Tamil Institute have decided that, look, we will do something to perfect his legacy. But, but to be frank, I think that in recent times, I was there yesterday, two days ago, I think that the government has started paying some attention to it. So it's not as horrible as it was two, three months ago. Let the nation have the conversation. What happened to the library? Why is it still there? Why is it rotting away? Why is Asumjee Park not up to scratch? He regretted, after seven years of the president's demise, partisan politics is still being pursued. Facts are facts, yes, that we, were, we had four and a half years. MPP has come two and a half years. But for how long are we going to be doing the politics while the state is crying? Many have also argued that just as the military cemeteries are kept for fallen soldiers, the Asumjue Park should be left under the care of the military for similar maintenance. That argument is a valid argument. Because if you go to the military cemetery, it's well kept. So if men in uniform who fall have a very decent place where they are buried, what about the commander-in-chief of the Ghana Armed Forces? He was the commander-in-chief of the Ghana Forces. It's not buried in a decent place. This could be a national debate for another day. Evelyn Tinkma, TV3 News, Accra. In other news this afternoon, President Akufuado has challenged former President John Dramani Mahama to name a single policy in his government introduced to boost the production of cocoa in the country. President Akufuado was addressing a deborah of chiefs at Dabwasi in the Wasa East District of the Western Region. President Akufuado wondered the whereabouts of the unprecedented road infrastructure of the Mahama administration. Everywhere you said roads were constructed turned out not to be so. Why would you keep saying you've done unprecedented infrastructure, especially on roads, when you've not done so? The president noted his predecessor did not speak the truth to Ghanaians during his tour of the Western North region. You did not tell Ghanaians the truth. We are here to do the job, so allow us execute our mandate. President Ekofuado outlined policies his government has undertaken to improve the cocoa sector, including the introduction of his government policies such as the hand pollination, mass pruning of cocoa trees using motorized pruners, among others. Chief Executive of Cocoa Board, Boahinedu, challenged the former president to tell Ghanaians what it did to better the lot of farmers. <laughs> Your friend mass spraying by OPM. On one of the high tech fertilizer. Former President Kufo brought a policy for farmers which was ensuring increase in cocoa production and was continued by late President Atamios. But President Mahama scrapped it, which greatly affected the production of cocoa in the country. He added that from the 2020-2021 cocoa season, every ton of cocoa beans from Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire to be sold on the international market will attract an additional $400 as a living income differential for farmers. So we're working the lines to speak to Kwame Agboja. He is a ranking member on the uh, Routes and Transport Committee of Parliament to put to him some of the concerns or the questions being raised by the current administration having to do with, one, what they really did to boost the cocoa sector when they were in power. Secondly, as uh, the, the president went there, he said that one of the key things they are telling him has to do with why the cocoa roads or roads in and around the cocoa growing areas in the country 
are still in poor state. He's joined us on the line now, Kwame Agboja. Good afternoon and thank you very much for your time, Honorable. Hello, Mr. Agboja. Hello, Mr. Agboja. Uh, we, are, we are unable to hear Mr. Kwame Agboja. He is a ranking member on the Roads and Transport Committee of Parliament. If you can hear me, sir, good afternoon once again. Uh, quite a terrible line there, but uh, we'll, we'll still try to see if we can get him on the line and then we can uh, ask him some of these questions regarding what his responses will be uh, regarding the accusations being leveled against the previous administration. Mr. Aguja, good afternoon, if you can hear me. Uh, good afternoon, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, the sitting president, that's uh, Nanado Dankwe Kufuado, yesterday spoke to the chiefs and people of Dabwasi where he says that, first of all, the roads leading in and around the cocoa growing areas in the country where he has visited are in terrible state. In the meantime, under the Mahama administration, your government said that you actually put in a lot to get those roads constructed. Where do you, what is your reaction to what the current president has said? Well, uh, good afternoon to your cherished viewers. Uh, I'm sad to use these words, but uh, the pre president was very, very uh, dishonest in, in his uh, reportage on the Cocoa Road. You remember that it was his government that took a decision and told the people of this country that almost all Cocoa Road, over 200 uh, Cocoa Road projects, were uh, procured illegally, that the, some of the road, uh, roads didn't exist, that the contracts were inflated. So for the past two and a half years, they were doing an investigation. In fact, many of those roads were at different stages of completion. 200 of those projects. If you talk about the Pretia to uh, 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 Samri Boy area, an area in this country with the largest uh, cocoa growing in terms of square meterage, that project was almost nearing completion. This government under President Kufado stopped it. Almost all those roads have deteriorated beyond uh, uh, comprehension now. And now, instead of going to apologize to the people of those cocoa growing areas, he's wrapping it in by telling them that it is the fault of President Mahama who actually awarded those projects. I am sure, in due course, somebody would have to answer and be set charge for this level of deliberate negligence of our cocoa roads in, the, in, the, uh, 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 in Ghana. So the president is just not being honest with the people. President Mahama awarded over 200 cocoa road projects. They were at different stages of completion. In fact, some of them were 95 Yeah, but, but Mr. Agboja, uh, Mr. Agboja, awarding the contract for the roads to be constructed is different from the roads being constructed. So uh, what, no, in, no, in no, putting no, this clarity to you, the issue, roads, roads is the president still being them. dishonest? Yes. Roads are not things you buy from the shelf. It takes time. To do the design and construct. I'm saying that over 200 cocoa roads were awarded. They were, in fact, we know the roads. They were, the contractors were on the road constructing. It was this government decision to deliberately stop those cocoa road projects. And I'm asking you, the media, as the president, since they, they claim that those roads were, 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 were awarded wrongly, that the roads didn't exist, that the contracts were inflated, in, 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 insist that they should tell, give you the report of that review, the two and a half years review, to show that NDC did something wrong. Rather, Instead of apologizing to the people of this area that it is a fault of the NPP that the roads have deteriorated, he's going there rubbing it, rubbing it. That's what I'm saying, that he's dishonest about this thing. That but Mr. Boja, are you, able to, are you able to tell us if any of the contracts awarded for the cocoa growing areas, the roads I mean, if any of the roads were completed? Well, I know in Western region, uh, when we went, uh, the committee went there, we were told some of them were even 98% complete. But we're told that they can't hand over because there was a review going, uh, uh, review going on. And these roads are, 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 were at different stages. It is not about, in fact, if, if, if the, by, the 20, by 2017, a lot of them were supposed to be completed. So the question is not whether it were completed before government changed. There are so many things that uh, cut, cut across government. The point is that this government refused to, uh, to honor the contract with Cocoa uh, uh, Road Contractors for almost two and a half years. So the mm. deterioration of the road today, I can tell you for a fact, roads that should have cost uh, uh, maybe $1 million uh, are now going to cost probably $2 million. So the loss of $1 million, somebody under the, uh, uh, in the president, Akufado's government, will have to answer that question for negligently causing financial loss to the state one day. And I'm, uh, my final word is that Kuku, uh, area, people living in cocoa growing areas should actually criticize the president and tell him in the face, mm. the roads in our areas are bad simply because you negligently ask the contractor to stop work 
on, on them. Otherwise, it would have been completed. Okay. Good have to leave it here for now, but thank you very much for making time to speak with us. Kwame Agboja is the uh, uh, Member of Parliament and also a ranking member on the Road and Transport Committee of Parliament. And uh, clearly the debate is on and it seems to have kick-started the whole campaign season, which is just next year, 2020. That's when Ghana goes to the polls again. We will be there and this is your election command center. Let's go to uh, the uh, central region now and the University of Education Weneba branch of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG, says its members are scandalized by a coup d'etat-like press release that was issued on July 23 by Dr. Frimpong K. Duku, president of UTAG and uh, his executives. That statement purported that members of UTAG branch of the EUW support a rather weird and most frivolous position of the self-declared reinstatement back to the office of the former vice chancellor, that is Professor Mauto Avoka, and some other dismissed staff of the university. But a statement issued by Eric Inketia on behalf of the UTAG EUW members said the press release represents the personal parochial views of Dr. Frimpong Keitre Duku and his executives and does not arise from a majority of the entire AUW UTAG members. And you would recall that yesterday, the former um, vice chancellor, that is uh, Professor Avoka, went to the school saying that he has been cleared by Ioku and for that reason, he is going to take his office. You see, uh, Lucy Ayambila um, has joined us on the phone line. She is our Ashanti, our central regional correspondent, and has joined us to give us the latest regarding the developments on campus. Lucy, good afternoon and thank you for your time. What is the latest on campus following this impasse? Yes, um, as we have already informed our viewers that Professor Aboke and his team are going to be the campus of uh, UW yesterday at Vimiba. It is true. Um, I'm told today that Professor Aboke will be visiting campus today and the subsequent days we are to do some checks but will not be in office. We will not be in office now. And, um, and have you been to campus to... today? Have you, again, maybe cited Professor Aboke who was there yesterday uh, saying that he wants to reinstate himself? Yes, I, I, I'm told he will be visiting campus today, but he's not yet there. So we are hoping to see him in a later afternoon. But okay. Now, security has been beat up on campus. I have cited about four police officers with armed police personnel patrolling campus. But apart from that, there is no mouth on campus. Have you spoken or interacted with any of the students and have they told you what kind of effect or impact this whole uh, debacle is having on them? Yes, I happen to have some chat with about some two or three students and they were telling me all that they need is a peaceful atmosphere so they can learn and then get whatever they want from the school and then leave. All right, but the uh, regular students are not yet in, you know, they are on vacation. So we spoke with some of the sandwich students. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Lucy Ayambila. She is our central regional correspondent with the latest from the University of Education, Weneba. Now, um, uh, we stay with that issue because the University of Education, Weneba branch of the uh, University Teachers Association have also taken their stance on this issue. And uh, whatever it is, we are waiting for the national branch to also speak. And uh, we'll get to hear what the university, the current vice chancellor, also has to say about this. And we'll keep you posted on that issue. Away from that, a governance expert has called for the immediate scrapping and removal of the payment of ex gratia to members of parliament after losing their positions. Professor Justice Baole, who is the incoming dean of the University of Ghana Business School, says such payments affect the national kitty and it's not fair. He was speaking at the 2019 second edition of the Nathan Anan Kwao annual award ceremony in Accra. Professor Justice Bawale expressed grave concern about huge sums of money paid to members of parliament as S. Gracia. He explained that such amounts are fed the national kitty, depleting resources meant for developing the country. He called on the civil and public servants to initiate a massive campaign against such payments. But closer can join the media on the conversation around S. Gracia. 
I think that thing must stop. If it must not stop, everybody must get it. Because it is not, it is not acceptable that somebody that we were together the, the, the last time, he joined DC or he became MP, the next four years he's the richest man in the district. Why? And, and apart from that, he's going to get S, X Russia 1, X Russia 2, X Russia 3. Why? I don't think that it is fair. As a country, we must be fair to all of us because we matter. And I say we must be fair to all of us because we are all constitutionally mandated agencies of the state. And therefore, when it is about appropriating the resources of the nation for all the agencies, all the agencies must be treated well. He again charged the civil and public servants to be professional and desist from maligning the institution. When politicians are messing up, they know. When they mess up and they see you defending them, they don't respect you. Because if they are closer and in their meetings, they themselves lambast each other. When they appear into the public domain, then they defend it with some level of bravery. So when they see you sitting somewhere and they think they themselves have condemned themselves on, you are celebrating and arguing for them, you are finished. The Executive Secretary of the Civil and Local Government Staff Association, Clocksack Ghana, Isaac Bampuado, however, criticized Parliament for passing laws which affected contributions of pensioners. Complaints about contradictory laws are right in the country. A case in point is the various legislations that have passed to exempt certain categories of workers within the public services from the National Pensions Act, seven services as amended. That's the desired objective of unification of pensions in Ghana has become a grand tax. A former commissioner of the Public Services Commission, Robert Saluti, cautioned politicians to avoid intimidating civil and public servants. Fortunes of our country's political history and its vicissitudes we also have made things worse when in the exercise of our duties, we no longer keep faith with our time-tested values, our work ethic. The Netanyahu Annual Awards was on the theme, enhancing political neutrality in the civil and local government services, the role of the politician. Other civil and public servants were awarded for their integrity and loyalty to the service. And let's stay on this subject matter because another leg of it has to do with the fact that there are reports that politicians are interfering in the work of civil servants. We've been joined in studio by Kujo Krakani. He is the Deputy Executive Secretary of Clock Sag. And we just want to uh, find out really if they say politicians are interfering in the work of the civil service, how do you mean? What kind of interference are we talking about? Here? Yeah, the first one. <coughs> Interfering simply means you bring in an officer outside the procedure of employment oh. and you let the person come to encumber your job. This is your job and then the chief executive is coming and he brings you along. Mm -hmm. You are not employed through the procedure and he comes to encumber your job and you are given a corner somewhere or you are even transferred somewhere. How frequent is this? Of late it's frequent, I mean quite frequent. In one ministry we have about nine cases. Nine cases in one ministry in Ghana and some other places too. So they, they, they literally bring in people we don't know. They call them personal assistants. We are not against them. Okay. But we are saying that they should go through the procedures of employment. And do they take the jobs of people who are already in specific areas? Yes, they take the jobs. So for instance, you are... Uh, Let's say I'm the chief director or uh, deputy chief director or something. They come and do set my exact schedule and you are thrown away from somewhere. You need to find out more as a, as a media house. We will. How long has this been ongoing and what kind of impact has it had on civil servants? No, it's about two years now, but it's rampant this year. And the impact is simple. You know, they come to do the job. And then when they are doing the job, the person who is on the job is not going to do it again. Mm. The frustration the is there. Mm. And the demotivation is there. Then when they go, who tells you the, the minister is staying there forever and ever? Mm. They are going away, and they go with the consultant or the personal assistant. Institutional memory is lost. The training that they can't give the people was not given to me when I was there. A lot of things happen, and it affects 
the totality of the ministry. And as a body, as CLOCSA, that is the Civil and Local Government Staff Association, I'm sure this has come to your attention. Yeah. What steps have you taken? We've taken very serious steps. One of them was to complain to the Chief of Staff. We had a meeting. The assignment was given to the Minister for Employment and Labor Relations to go and deal with those things. And then it was still happening. Then there was a, an attempt to, there was a preparation. We were preparing towards a demonstration, massive demonstration against it. Mm. Last month, then the national security came in and then they gave the assignment to the senior minister to handle. He's, it is ongoing. It is ongoing. Yes. That's a political term being used, ongoing. ongoing. But wouldn't you say it was right from the onset a lost cause if you are going to the politicians, that is the chief of staff, to report something that you are saying politicians are doing to you. Mm. So going back to report to them was a lost cause. Why couldn't you probably have gone to court right from the onset? Or there is you no know, such... In uh, every situation, we are maturing and we want to exhaust all the procedures, all the procedures, all the processes. We give respect to the government and we want to approach the chief of staff and then we have a lot of respect for the senior minister. Mm. If anything fails, we are fond of we can go to court. What timelines are you looking at? We are looking at one month. It's about almost close to the end of the time. Okay. We've started, we have one or two meetings with the senior minister. We are close to the time. And I'm sure with the, the, the intelligence on the ground, they will not want to make a mistake. Okay. We'll see how this unfolds in the coming days, but thank you very much for making time to speak with us. Kojo Krakani is the Deputy um, Executive Secretary of Clock SAG, uh, helping us understand the frustrations they are going through, saying that politicians are interfering in the work of the civil servants. We'll definitely investigate this as well as a media house. This is still Midday Live on TV3. We'll be back with more, but before we go, though, the education of Winneba. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with more. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. This is still Midday Live. Let's go back to the central region. DSP Irene Opong is the Central Regional Police Command PRO. Madam, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. To start with, we know that yesterday the former uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Education, Winneba, came there with his team and he raised some concerns. The issue we want to find out from you is, did they seek clearance or did what they, uh, what they did could it have caused any sort of trouble from the point of the police? Uh, thank you very much. Yesterday in the afternoon, Winneba District Police Command, upon intelligence gathered, uh, had the information that the former VC uh, and his, some personalities were at the uh, UEW campus to hold a press conference with media men present. So police moved in and we moved in to talk to the professor and his interact to stop with the uh, media and the, the press conference because the same intelligence that we gathered led to the fact that if we should allow the press conference to go on and information that he intends giving to the media goes out. There will be some clashes and there will be problems for us right. on campus. So as law enforcement agencies, we went there uh, to make sure that we are able to prevent the crime from happening. Again, I want to set this on record. Right. It wasn't the uh, Winneba police or uh, the crime officer for Winneba who gave protection to uh, the, the former VC and his men to enter before the police came. Oh. He rather led men from Winneba district to come in when the program was about to start. Oh, okay. That was what really, yes, that was what really happened. So it wasn't from your outfit? Sorry? It wasn't from your outfit, the police that he came with? The police, we, the police, we went there. We went there when we gathered the information that there was a press conference about to start. Right. That was where we went there. Okay. But then uh, the information we had was that uh, uh, 
section of the public is saying that it was the police that gave protection to, to him. Right. Uh, the former VC to enter the campus and uh, when he was about to start, it was the same police that came into his job. No. Okay. We went there when he has already seated, uh, cameras set, and it was about to start. Then we went in to talk to him and his personal right, uh, right. persons involved that they should drop it for us to continue to maintain the peace on campus. Of the because place. After okay. that press conference, it will lead to other things. Thank you for the clarity you have put to this issue. DSP hiring upon. Thank you very much for making time to speak with us. She is the public relations officer of the Central Regional Police Command. Time now for the sanitation campaign. And that hashtag should be trending by now. Hashtag garbage out. Now, Asun Kushia in the central region is famed for its cleanliness as one hardly finds an iota of filth anywhere in the community. As part of our sanitation campaign dubbed Garbage Out, Solomon Mensa sets out to find out how the chiefs and people of Asin Kushia have been able to achieve this feat. It is a community in the central region that boldly throws a challenge to any other town or city in the country for a contest in terms of cleanliness. One upon entering a Sin Kushia is greeted by a signpost affirming the community's cleanliness. On the shoulders of the road leading to the town proper are crocodile and fish ponds, and there would be ultra modern palace when completed. These serve as a source of attraction to tourists and visitors. Barrels painted in the colors of the national flag as well are down the shoulders of the road here, serving as dustbins. This is the Asin Kushia community where the residents say they basically respect their leader, that's their chief, and so this has been their practice, they don't litter. Wednesdays are earmarked as a community labor day at Asin Kushia where there is no any other activity until after cleaning the township. Abna Drua Mensa hails from Asin Kushia and is the member of parliament for Asin North. She says Kushia's cleanliness has not been a day's job. Started way back. Every Wednesday, there's the Omai Ijuma or community, community work that the whole community come together to do to clean up the Orenchi kingdom. Abna Drua Mensa says the chief of the Orienti Kingdom of Asin Kushia, Ahunabobrim Nana Prajin Sem the Sith, himself partakes in the community labor, throwing a challenge to Ghanaian leaders to emulate. Nana Prajin Sem has never been left out of this exercise. Any Wednesday that he's in Accra, he and his chiefs, the elders, the youth, everybody, he's even the first person to come down from his house on Wednesdays when he's, he's in Orienti mine. People so will usually be seen within their school compounds whenever they grow bushy. Ahunabwebrim Nana Prajin Sem the Sith says what he together with his residents have been able to achieve is not above any other person. Trust me, it is not uh, beyond anybody to be able to achieve this. You only need to let the people know the importance of keeping your environment clean and you yourself living up to it. He says Ghana could achieve its desired cleanliness if the needed facilities, like the provision of dustbins and toilets, are in place. You know, sanitation is simply creating a system to make a place hygienic and neat. So you need to create a system. The creation of system involves providing facility whereby people will use. Residents are full of praise for their chief. Our chief yearns for cleanliness. He encourages us to participate in communal labor. We respect and obey him. The chief has made the town a tourist attraction center 
There are many towns and cities in the country, but none could be compared to Asin Kushia. Checks at the Kushia Health Center revealed for over eight years now, it had not recorded any cholera case by residents. For even malaria cases, it is mostly reported by communities that surround Kushia. James Muzuli is physician assistant and officer in charge at the Kushia Health Center. The town is indeed very clean and I think that it is really helping in terms of maybe reduction of cholera cases. Since I came here 2011, we've never had a cholera case in this community and so maybe we can attribute that to the sanitation. At the coronation of the Queen of Kushia, the Ministry of Sanitation and Water Resources bestowed on Hunabrubrim Nana Prajan Sem the Sith the accolade of a sanitation ambassador. The Sanitation and Water Resources Minister, Cecilia Dapa, urged all to emulate residents of Kushia to promote cleanliness. It has been a beautiful experience at Kushia here in the central region. And as the signpost behind me says, we hope we never forget us. Indeed, we can't forget about Kushia. This has been Solomon Mensa for TV3, Kushia Central Region. Time now for business. Thank you very much for staying with us. And uh, President Akufuado has commissioned an operational office complex for the Ghana National Gas Company Limited at AB Bukazo in the Elembele district of the Western Region. The gas complex will serve as a command control center for remote operations of the gas of the company's gas processing plants and associated pipelines and stations, as well as be a center for training and conferences. The gas complex was originally conceived as an integral component of the Western Corridor Gas Infrastructure Development Project Agreement, which was signed with Sinopec Corporation in November 2011. Construction of the facility began in November 2017 and was completed as scheduled in November 2018 by Sinopec Corporation together with other subcontractors. President Takufuado at a debut to commission the headquarters noted the project is an important milestone in the delivery of the Western Corridor Gas Infrastructure Development Project Agreement. He was confident the facility would be a game changer in the push towards industrializing Ghana's economy. We must commend the board and management of Ghana Gas for seeing this dream to its full realization and especially celebrate with the people, the good people of Vinzama who will be the direct beneficiaries of many such development projects the government through the company will be undertaking in this area. Government is undertaking all these projects to bring in Zama to a status befitting of a world-class oil or gas and oil community. Chief Executive for Ghana Gas Company Limited, Dr. Ben K. B. Asante, indicated the gas complex is anchored on three developmental pillars that serve as the fulcrum for advancing organizational and community development. We're talking about gas for power and gas also for industry. And this vision that we have is supported by three de development pillars. That of business development, personnel or staff development, as well as community development and engagement. Western Regional Minister Kwabnao Trida comments and said, the facility is a fulfillment of a long advocacy for relevant oil and gas companies to have their headquarters in the Western region. It is our vision to make this enclave the petroleum hub of Ghana. We are looking at fertilizer production, training of quality human resources, as well as the manufacturing of petroleum assets. Our friends in Southern Alberta Institute of Technology in Canada are also very happy and ready to help us with such training. In the near future, we believe that a special university of oil and gas shall also be found in this enclave. 
In other business news this afternoon, a financial analyst and director of strategy and business operations at Dalex Finance, Joe Jackson, has observed the financial sector cleanup has uh, led to the liquidity challenges which could result in collapsing some institutions that survived the exercise. He indicated the need for the central bank to release money to the consolidated bank and affected customers. The country's banking sector cleanup has seen the number of commercial banks dropped from 33 to 23. Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Ernest Addison, has stated the cleanup is yielding results. Banks' total assets amounted to 112.8 billion Ghana CDs. The increase in total assets was funded mainly from deposits. Executive Director of Ghana Microfinance Institutions Network, Yao Jenfi, is of the view it will take a little longer for the benefits to be realized. With the projections that we've done, we anticipate that the next four or five years we'll have a very strong financial system if we don't relax on our duties. The cleanup of the financial sector led to panic withdrawals. The minimum 10% liquidity buffer was stretched as customers demanded funds, but deposits continued to decline, negatively affecting liquidity requirements of the banks. This, according to a financial analyst, Joe Jackson, has led to demand outpacing money supply. Everybody who had money with other local institutions started getting worried that, wow, is our money safe? And so started pulling out their money. There was a death of money in all these institutions because simply people felt that my money will be safer with me. Managing Director of CDH Savings and Loans, Martin Asamoah, has noted the situation is worrying, adding a lot more financial institutions could collapse due to liquidity challenges facing the sector. The public, they have some confidence in the regulator. So if they come out and give a message out there that yes, you are behind these institutions, we are giving them all the necessary support, we make sure the right things are done. So people go back and do business. Ghanaians will definitely get the confidence that they have trusted in us over the years. A chartered banker and a personal investment consultant, Patrick Abankwaba, is of the view that the surviving banks and other financial institutions need to put in strategies to bring back confidence into the system. The few or the money that are circulating in the, in the economy, most of them are going to the well-established banks that people know of and can trust, whilst the other banks are still struggling to get the few deposit. If the little banks or the smaller banks are not able to get a deposit, what it means is that they cannot also lend to other customers. Barely two years into the financial sector cleanup, some players in the sector think the central bank needs to go beyond the cleanup to make the exercise successful. That's it for business on Midday Live. We will be returning with the latest in the world of sports with Yao Ofusulani. Stay with us. In entertainment news this afternoon, the VGMA Artist of the Decade, Sarkodie, is set to release a new album titled Black Love. Sarkodie, in a post on social media, made known that the debut single of the album will hit the media space on Friday, July 26, 2019. The upcoming project features renowned African artists like Stoneboy, Ifia, Wandiko, and actor-musician Idris Elba. a month after releasing a seven-track tape dubbed Alpha, one of the most decorated Ghanaian rappers, Sarkodie, is hinting of the release of another album. In what appears to be the behind the scenes of some studio sessions, he posted on social media within the late hours on Tuesday, July 23. Even
Even though very little is known about the album at the moment, Sarkodie hinted of the release date of the first single of the album on Friday, July 26, 2019. The upcoming album, titled Black Love, features top artists like Sister Ifia, Stoneboy, Ifia, Visakede, Wanda Cole, and actor and musician Idris Elba. Looking forward to that album and the songs on it. Now, in other stories, Jamaica Entertainment and Prophetic Music Production have launched the first Roots Reggae Festival, a musical event to celebrate unity and strength of the African diaspora. The festival, which forms part of activities for the year of return, will be headlined by acclaimed reggae musicians, including Grams Morgan and Una Morgan from Morgan Heritage, the culture reggae band featuring Kenyatta Hill, Ghanaian reggae star Black Prophet Samini and Amanziba Nat Brew. The festival will feature two shows. The first concert will be held at the Labadi Beach Hotel Beachfront on November 30, then to Kumasi Sports Stadium on December 6. The final concert will take place at the Tamale Sports Stadium on December the 8th. In addition to the three shows, organizers will conduct the Root Reggae Master Jam contest to unearth unique music talents. I will definitely be uh, partaking in that contest to uh, show how uh, talented I am when it comes to reggae music. You know what me I say? That's it for the bulletin. Thank you very much for watching. There is more news on our website, 3news.com. My name is Martin Esiedu Dati. Do have a good afternoon. As always, stay positive. Bye for now.